Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Vivian Bartlett on May 22, 2022. The tragic death of Vivian's brother when he was a teenager was the impetus to Vivian and his mother searching for a spiritual reason for this traumatic loss that led them to the Baha'i faith. Vivian is now a retired secondary school teacher. At the end of 1999, he got involved in a youth empowerment program started by the Baha'is in Swindon, England, that was transformative and successful and was instituted in a number of schools there. He wrote about the experience in his book, Nurturing a Healthy Human Spirit in the Young. Vivian wrote a second book entitled Navigating Materialistic Minefields. He had a dear friend who was an atheist and they would have wonderful deep conversations and after his friend passed away, Vivian decided to write this book dedicated to his friend that would answer some of the questions from a different perspective than the one his friend had. I started the interview by asking Vivian where he grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I was born and brought up in Cardiff in South Wales in the UK just after the Second World War, so I'm knocking on a bit now. I'm the eldest of five children. My family were not really religious, although my father made an attempt to instill something into us by keeping us in on a Sunday because it was the Sabbath And as far as I know, I didn't go to church related to that at all. As far as I know, that was just an incarceration for a Sunday while I saw all my friends playing outside, (laughs) Mm. which was a little bit disconcerting. I went to school in Cardiff and I left school with virtually no qualifications whatsoever. (laughs) And what was your spiritual journey that led you to the Baha'i faith? It was through a calamitous situation. My brother, who had just turned 14 years of age, I was going on 16 years of age. I had not long started work to serve an apprenticeship in engineering down what's called Tiger Bay or (laughs) the docks in Cardiff. And I remember cycling home from work one lovely summer evening and saw a large crowd outside my, my home in Ely in Cardiff. Some neighbors suddenly came to me and were consoling me and saying, you know, your brother's had an accident, be prepared for something. I went inside the house and saw my brother on the floor receiving some form of artificial respiration. This was the old fashioned type, trying to revive the person with the arms being brought up over the head and back down. I thought my brother was joking because he was always joking. We were all joking around and scrapping as you usually do. But unfortunately, he was dead. He had accidentally electrocuted himself by making an extension lead from the front room onto the garden where he'd taken my tape-to-tape recorder to play out in the fresh air. Um, My mother hadn't seen him do this, but she was there and saw her son, her second son, die in front of her. And that started a whole process of trying to work out, well, what is life about I was very much just involved in the physical things of life as a young man, just getting used to things, more energy to do this, and a little income coming in from working as well. That's how I bought the uh, tape to tape uh, recorder. But for my mother, she went on a desperate search to find, well, well, what's the meaning in life if we're here today and gone tomorrow? Is there a purpose in life? Is there a life after death? This became a preeminent question in actual fact. My father, God bless him, never really recovered from that shock. And he used to take pots of flowers to my brother's grave every Sunday and just stay there. I don't think he was involved in any prayers or anything like that, but it it just shocked him entirely. Whereas it drove my mother onto a search for finding out these type of questions. If we're here today, gone tomorrow, if life is so transient, what's it all about? 
And that search was like a crazy person searching, uh, one mad trying to find out. She went here, there and everywhere, various denominations of Christianity, other religions and so on. I joined her in this search, uh, more out of curiosity rather than, than the extensive searching that she was into. And she was joined as well by a, a young girl around the corner, same age as myself, when we met together, that was 17 years of age, and she was intensely involved in this search as, as well, but from a different angle, because uh, according to her upbringing, her father being a, an active communist and a shop steward in a factory in Cardiff there, according to her religious teaching, he was going to hell because he didn't believe in God and because of his communism, but he was a uh, one of the loveliest men you could ever come across. No prejudice whatsoever, except <laughs> against religion. So she was concerned about his well-being and what would happen to him after he died. We went to Sufism, Buddhism, other aspects of Islam, Hinduism, Theosophy, Madame Bovatsky, Gurdjieff, Uspensky, anything at all we could get our hands on. And then one day, my mother saw an advertisement in the local paper, a meeting on the Baha'i faith in Cardiff, and she said to Rita, this young girl who had joined her, who eventually, by the way, became my wife, they worked out that they would like to go to this public meeting, this Baha'i public meeting. They went along to it, and after the talk, it had such an effect upon Rita that she realized this was correct, this was right straight there and then. My mother, she wanted a bit more proof for that, and she asked for some of the writings of, of the founder of the Baha'i faith, which she was told was Baha'u'llah. And they tried to give us some sort of introductory books, which were easy to understand, but she insisted she wanted a book written by the founder Baha'u'llah, whose name means the glory of God, we found out later. And she insisted, and she was given the book called the kitab e the Book of Certitude, written by Baha'u'llah in two days, over two days and two nights. She read it in three weeks, and she said, this is for me, this is what I'm looking for, and she enrolled in the Baha'i community from there. For myself, I was very hesitant. I was just wondering, is my mother getting involved in some form of a cult? What is it about? I was highly protective, I think, but then... As meetings were taking place in my home in Cardiff, and I started meeting the Baha'is, they speaking about their teachings of the, the oneness of mankind and the oneness of religion and wonderful things that do with life after death that we, we hadn't come across before, it all started making sense. But the people themselves seemed to be very different to other people that I'd met. These were kind. These were caring people. They were interested in me. I felt they weren't there to convert me, but they were to accompany me on my spiritual journey. That basically, it was just accepting Baha'u'llah and his teachings. Baha'u'llah is the latest teacher from God sent in a series of teachers to educate mankind and bring us closer to God and to contribute to the betterment of society. So accepting those teachings, accepting Baha'u'llah as the latest messenger of God that we call manifestations of God, I did that on that occasion, and that, that was over 55 years ago, and I have never looked back. I've never had one moment of regret, Warren, not one moment. Plenty of tests, but no moments <laughs> of regret. Vivian, you've written several books, and I'd like to discuss two of them with you. And the first is called Nurturing a Healthy Human Spirit in the Young. Yeah. So what inspired you to write this book? I've been working with young people most of my adult life. I, eventually, I came out of engineering. I was in the Merchant Navy as an engineer for a few years, and then I came back home from that and went to uni and got a, a degree in education and became a secondary school teacher here. So I've always had a big interest in young people within the Baha'i community as well. And my wife and myself, we did fostering as well as having three lovely children. So all the time involved with young people. I was invited this one time at the end of 1999 to join a small group of Baha'is in Swindon in England who were going to enable a 
process or to arrive at a process whereby we as a small group of Baha'is there could help a special need in that town. And I was invited because of my involvement with young people to think about perhaps we could work together to provide a course or some help disaffected youngsters, the youngsters that people have many difficulties with. What sort of uh, encouraged me at the time was that where I used to teach in school, I used to come across them a lot of the time. So I had experience with working with them. Cut a long story short, we started to work together and we provided a program for disaffected children that we were hoping we could take into schools. And this program we called the Swindon Youth Empowerment Program. And we developed two experiences for these youngsters one was called the Tranquility Zone and the other Discovery Zone. And the idea was for these youngsters to actually not just be spoken to or words directed at all the time, as we do a lot in school, but how do we enable them to become agents in their own transformation? And we realize that they have to ex have a, a different experience to the life that they were involved in at that time. So when I say these disaffected children, uh, I just want to uh, <laughs> outline something with the first bunch of youngsters that we had coming along. They were brought by a youth development worker, a social worker, involved in a 12 to 18 program, 12 to 18 years of age program. And she was helping young people between those ages who were not in, necessarily in school, but have fallen foul of the law or difficulties in in their own lives on the streets or whatever. She brought along the first group and we had prepared this tranquility zone and this discovery zone, not realizing whether would it be effective at all. And when we heard these youngsters coming to the first event ever that we were going to put on after struggling to produce the program, we thought, oh my gosh, this is not going to go well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They were shouting and swearing and pushing each other that they came along. We settled them down a little bit, prepared them to go into the tranquility zone. And the tranquility zone is an arrangement of a room, like as if you were in a large tent and there was sub subdued lighting. We had candles, first of all. We soon found out that it's best to get rid of candles with these youngsters. So we had subdued lighting. We had flowers and uh, cushions around the floor and it was all just a, a very pleasant environment and we invited them to come into this into the room of which we'd also made fragrances of attar of roses which was beautiful but one youngster when he came in <laughs> he'd never come across this before i don't think in his life and he went oh 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 what's that smell mm -hmm. and we thought oh my gosh we're off to a good start here Another youngster there was with a big bag of sweets, just chucking his sweets around and uh, distracting everybody. And we just managed to say a few kind words to this person and saying, you're so wonderful, you're so generous and willing to share what you have with everybody. But John, if you'd like to settle down now, we're, we're going to start this tranquility empowerment program. So we, we started going through that. I can speak a bit more about that in a little while and the discovery zone itself. So my involvement is through that process of wanting to be of help to young people to continue. And I was especially invited by the Baha'is in Swindon to be involved in that. What would you say is was the secret to transform these kids mm. to a, a set of kids that you felt were transformed? I'd like to take us back to a wonderful insight given to us by the ancient philosophers. Many of them said, we should get to know ourselves, know thyself. And a lot of the problems arise in society because we don't know who we are as human beings, what we're made of. Of course, looking into the Baha'i writings over the years, I became aware of insights into our own reality, which are really astounding and wonderful and so enlightening and uplifting. And it's built up around two statements I'm thinking of by Baha'u'llah about our reality. He says, true loss is for him whose days have been spent in utter ignorance of his self. 
And another one, man should know his own self and recognize that which leadeth unto loftiness or lowliness, glory or abasement. So knowing ourselves is an extremely important part of becoming aware of our potential. I'd like to just give an analogy of that. Imagine now that we had, I love analogies, by the way, and symbolism. Imagine that we have a car and we we get in the car. It's a very powerful car. We get into the car. We sit down. We can rest. We can recline the seats and have a snooze. We can look out the window and see people passing by. We can eat our sandwiches in the car if we want, have a cup of coffee. We can put the radio on or hear some recorded music. We can do all that. But the car really hasn't been made for that purpose. We're not getting anywhere. And to really understand about our own reality is to understand that we can take it up with those things which are useful and nice, but it's really not getting anywhere in life. And so one of the main, well, two main quotations of Baha'u'llah, we built the course around, which we feel were the victories in enabling youngsters to understand their own selves. This is the first one, is that Baha'u'llah says, regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. That's a phenomenal statement when you think about it, you know, rich in gems of inestimable, we can't estimate the gems or the jewels that lie inside each one of us. You know, it's beyond our estimation, they're so valuable. What we're looking at here is primarily the, the gems of values or virtues, such as kindness, justice, knowledge, love, wisdom, forgiveness, and so on. All these wonderful gems. There are other gems of inestimable value as well, our talents, our skills, and so on. But primarily, we were focused on these type of inner conditions that we could aspire to. And the second passage from the Baha'i writings is that every child is potentially the light of the world, and at the same time, it's darkness. So every child is potentially the light of the world, and at the same time, it's darkness. So we have, according to the teachings, Baha'i teachings, is that we have a dual nature. It says in another place that every child is born holy and pure. So no child is born evil or bad in any way, although the body might be all manner of difficulties with the body through disabilities or inherited physical things, but the soul itself, this is what we understand, it's born holy and pure. It comes in existence at that time of conception and later on when the child is born. So when we look at these two things here, we have a dark nature and we have a light nature. We have a low nature and we have a high nature. And this understanding about ourselves, when we realize it, and when young people realize it, it has a profound effect upon them. So, for instance, in our high nature, we realize that we have these gems of inestimable value. All of us can be kind, generous. We can be patient. We can be courteous, forgiving. We can be equitable. All these wonderful qualities that every one of us has just waiting to be mined from our inner condition. But we also have the dark side of our nature, the negative characteristics of cruelty, anger, hate, spitefulness, vengeance, all these type of things that really drag us down and have been associated with the lower ego of man. So what we used to do within these two zones, the tranquility zone and the discovery zone, was give them an experience through storytelling in the tranquility zone about their high nature qualities. And then in the discovery zone, we were marking out the difference between the high nature qualities and the low nature qualities to the extent that they could see, ah, if I move towards my high nature qualities, then I will be happy. Because if I'm kind, if I'm forgiving, if I'm generous, if I'm patient, all these wonderful qualities, then those actually enhance our happiness or bring us happiness. Whereas down the low nature end, this cruelty, wishing to be spiteful, not conforming to things which are necessary for the good running of the family or the school or society, all these type of things bring us unhappiness. So we shifted 
with the games that we used to play with them as well and the storytelling and, and the examples within the tranquility zone experience we shifted their views from where they could find happiness rather than relating it to the physical things such as i'm only happy if i got the best trainers or a girlfriend or boyfriend or if i got these clothes or if i get good presents at christmas or i go away on holiday somewhere which i enjoy we shifted happiness although that can be helpful but we shifted it basically from that way of looking at things to we are happy when we have these high nature qualities which are referred to in the baha'i writings as spiritual qualities i can tell you warren when youngsters realized that it was a, had a profound change with regards to the way they approach things most of them if i can end up by this answering this question that you asked most of the young people that came eventually we got into over 25 schools primary and secondary schools and we were taking the course to the most disaffected youngsters in these schools between the ages of 8, 9 to 16, 17 even. We were told by these youngsters, I didn't know I had a high nature. And they, all of them said in their own words, this is what invariably they would say, I didn't know I had a high nature. I always thought down the low nature end of me. And they said, I felt like crap. That was the word that they would use a lot. I was living in that condition. But when they were involved in discovering this through the processes we were taking them through and realizing that they had a high nature, this had a profound effect upon them. Can you tell us, Vivian, what you witnessed as the fruits of these uh, maybe one or two folks that completed the program and described for us where their lives went as a result of going through this program? Sure, yeah. What I'm doing now is just digging into my book a little bit, the nursery book, and I just would like to read out two examples of the effect that it's had. And and this has been enormous over the years as well. There's literally been hundreds, maybe thousands have gone through this program, although I'm not involved in it now. It's still running in Swindon. We used to train up the teachers and the learning mentors to run the program. So we had a whole cohort (laughs) in all these schools of these primary and secondary school teachers. In actual fact, over the past, what, seven, eight years, nine years, uh, my health hasn't been good. So I haven't been able to uh, as things that I wanted to, but it's recovered somewhat now. And we started this program going in South Wales schools. They're writing back to us all the time saying the wonderful effect it's having on the youngsters. They've taken one cohort of nine youngsters in the middle of taking another cohort of 10 through. Then there's another 10 linked behind them. And they've had after school clubs for five evenings a week on the course, on the empowerment course as well. So we're at the start of trying to get this going in schools in in Wales. But this is just a little story about a young girl. So I put in the book, let me share with you an uplifting story about a 12-year-old girl who had experienced these sessions in the empowerment program. This girl had been referred to the empowerment sessions because she was always in some type of trouble or another. Her recent problem was that she had been strongly suspected of stealing money and had been questioned by the school staff and parents over a few days. She had resisted every attempt to persuade her to confess. And because there was no actual witness of the theft, this could not be proven. Pressure was taken off the girl. The matter had to be dropped and time went by. She was known in actual fact for stealing on previous occasions. So this wasn't unusual to suspect her. Immediately after attending empowerment sessions during this time, I think she came to about two or three sessions out of the 10 that they had experience of. She went to the head after the first few sessions, went to the head of year and admitted what she had done. The head of year stated that was because of this girl's experience in the tranquility and discovery zones that day that she had decided to tell the truth. Experience had shown that she was not the type to back down when cornered, but after the sessions, she had definitely changed for the better with a heightened feeling of self-worth. She was the happier for it. So she, Warren, she was demonstrating immediately after finding out about high nature quality of honesty, she immediately 
responded to that and started being honest. And this is another story. And it's to do with a young person who's experienced the two zones itself. And I start off it like this. Um, but let us demonstrate through the words of a 13-year-old girl. Sorry, both girls at the moment. Lots of them are boys, by the way, <laughs> who are in difficulty. Through the words of a 13-year-old girl whose parents were very concerned that she was being bullied, who was shy, lacked a lot of confidence and had low self-esteem. So this is what she wrote. It has been nearly a year since we finished the empowerment program. I really miss coming and I feel like I want to continue with it. I feel I was able to help my family and settle arguments. It has helped me to relax more. When I feel angry or upset, I remember the words that I am a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. They learn that and they repeat it many times, by the way. So I remember the words that I am a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. I think about my gems a lot and feel stronger in myself. I feel I have value and can be the light of the world. So she was bringing that to the conversation here, that she felt she was the light of the world. It helps me to think good things about myself. The stories have made me think more about other people rather than just thinking of myself. It has made me happier and calmer and more willing to help other people. Which is interesting because in another place in the Baha'i writings it says, you know, most of us perhaps in life we, we're trying to chase happiness. And happiness is the most elusive butterfly. Uh, you've got to catch a butterfly if you ever try to do it. It's not where you think it is, it's gone somewhere else. If we're seeking happiness, it's my understanding, and from the writings of all the major religions that have come to us through a series of wonderful teachers from God, where there's Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, Krishna, Moses, and so on, that all of them said in their own particular way, this is the way it says in the Baha'i writings, human happiness is founded on spiritual behavior. Human happiness is founded on spiritual behavior. And dare I say that what we're going into, what we started in this process with these disaffected youngsters that we call dispirited, by the way, not disaffected, because we knew they were out of connection with their lovely human spirit, which God has made to be noble. They realized by developing, bringing out these wonderful qualities, these gem-like qualities inside their human spirit, inside their soul, that they were happier for it. So they had realized that human happiness is founded on spiritual behavior. It doesn't say that spiritual happiness is founded on attending any church, mosque or synagogue or anything, as important as those may appear, but it's the way in which we can practice these, these wonderful qualities that are inherent in our souls, in everybody's soul from the time of birth. And our job as adults really is to create the right environments for those that potential to grow just like a seed if it's planted in the right soil in the right environment it will grow into a wonderful flower or bush or tree and bring forth everything that's inherent in it that god has planted in our souls which are unique to us do you have an example of a boy that went through this transformation there were quite a few, but the first lot that went through, there were two girls there. They were on the verge of committing suicide. One of them, her brother, had died through a drug overdose, and the other one was just so insecure and out of sorts with herself that, you know, life wasn't worth living for her. And we knew that they were on the edge of wanting to take their lives. Oh, it's so sad when you, you come across that with youngsters. It really oh, it touches my heart when I think of the suffering these young people go through. Not just the ones who are close to suicide, but the ones who are involved in so many other things as well with drug addiction or they get used to alcohol and gangs and being bullied or being bullies themselves. But anyhow, uh, one of these girls went on to be a lawyer later on, and the other one, I believe, she went into catering. But another youngster, after the empowerment program, the evaluator, Professor Stephen Bigger from 
Worcester University, who was head, I believe, of the education department of Worcester University, he came and evaluated what we were doing. And he wrote, oh, it was so wonderful, a 57-page report on how much he admired it, he supported it. And he said, basically, in his, I'm just paraphrasing now, that this should be in all the schools in the UK which was a wonderful support. But anyhow, one of his uh, youngsters that he evaluated, he went to see this youngster. I think he must have been about 15, 16 years of age, and I think he'd attended the program some years earlier. He said, do you think, I'll call him John for the want of a better word. They're all called John. All the boys are called John, by the way. He said, John, after the you were in the empowerment program for that week, did it change your life in any way for that week? He said, it's changed my life. He said, I knew that I was on the way to prison. I was going to prison by the way I was behaving. He said, this is what would usually happen. If I saw a kid walking up the street, he said, I would go over to him. I'd have a fight with him. And I think many of us have come across youngsters when we were children, when we were young people, especially in adolescence and so on. You're going to have to look at some youngsters a particular way and you're in for it. You're going to be involved in the scrap. And he was one of these youngsters that you wouldn't look at. However, he was extremely handsome, very, very handsome, but the scourge of the school. He said, when I see another kid across the street from me, he said, I'll walk up to him. And I think the kid might, might have been petrified because he had a reputation, this youngster. He walked up to him, he said, and he got chatting with him. He said, I wanted to do this because he said, I, and this is what he said in the evaluation. He said, I realized I am a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. And he said, I wanted to bring out some of those gems of friendship and kindness and so on. And then he said, he got chatting with with this other youngster. And he said, I realized that he is a mine rich in gems of inestimable value as well. So he said, I I was really wanted to find out what his gems were, how kind he was, was he friendly, all these wonderful things that we have inherent in us. And I'm just hoping, I haven't heard anything else from him, but I'm hoping that that's this way of going through life has survived all the materialism and all the pulls of negativity that surround us at this time. I'm speaking with Vivian Bartlett, and we're talking about his book entitled Nurturing a Healthy Human Spirit and the Young, and it really is describing a youth empowerment program created in Wales. Vivian, let's go on to your second book. It's interesting because it's an interesting segue into what you had just said about hoping that these young people uh, don't succumb to the negative aspects of this world as they continue their journey into adulthood. You wrote a book entitled Navigating Materialistic Minefields. What inspired you to write this book? Yeah, well, that's a heck of a title for a start, isn't it? I don't know whether it's the right title. Over the many years of reading the Baha'i writings and being involved with many activities within the community and the wider community, for instance, I'm a founder member of the Interfaith Council for Wales, which has been going for quite a number of years now. So it enables me to bring a certain view on spirituality to these type uh, environments as well. Yeah, just to go back for the beginning of this, I had a friend, he's passed away now, a lovely friend, absolutely wonderful spiritual soul, but he called himself an atheist, like I did at one time. I was an atheist before I became a Baha'i. I had no regard for religion. I thought religion was added to the problems of the world rather than cured them. Over the years, reading the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, his son, I become aware that I had a wrong understanding of what religion is. I was looking at religion from, should we say, what many people understand as religion, the rites, the ceremonies, the traditions, the dogmas. You can't find most of them in the original sacred scriptures of any of the religions. They, they're all just add-ons. So I was very very disappointed in religion, thinking of it that way, and threw the baby out with a bathwater, if I can put it like that. So my good friend now, for over 30 years, a really rock-solid atheist, and he used to bring forward so many arguments and ways of looking at things in the kindest way, a very educated person. 
but he had a, a whole array of all the horrors of things that have gone wrong in the world and just going through reiterating these time and time again of these difficulties in the world from the two world wars to the famines in the world to terrorism to all the the terrible things that mankind has gone through especially in the 20th century and of course he was well versed in in history as well so he could he could add that lot to it as well all the, the crusades in the inquisition we spoke for many many years and towards the end of his life he realized that he got comfort from the Baha'i teachings. And this prompted me, I thought, well, gosh, why can't I just use those arguments he was putting forward if I could remember them and put them into a book, bring them forward and try to answer them looking through a spiritual lens rather than the materialistic lens that my friend was looking at life through. The book is focused on looking at all these problems, all these difficulties that we go through as atheists and we don't find an answer for, what I try to bring forward is looking through the spiritual lens of the teachings of the Baha'i faith, which are so insightful and up-to-date for us now. They're not shrouded in antiquity, which the ancient religions are. That's not to say that they don't have value. They are absolutely necessary. And the inner essence of these have carried on through Baha'u'llah and will carry on into the future through other great messengers of God or manifestations of God that Baha'u'llah says will come to mankind as we need it for our next stages of progress. So really, it was to try to come to grips with materialistic reductionism where everything in, is, in life is just reduced to the material all the time rather than things which are not material but have exceptionally important part to play in, in our life. And I'd just like to make a difference between the two here. The material things exist, of course, and you know, a tree, I'm looking out my window now, I'm surrounded by lovely trees and the bird and like there's flowers and there's the minerals that we see around us all the time. All the things of life, the animals and ourselves with our physical body, and we've got the universe, the vast universe. All of this we can see has material existence. But there's also things that don't have material existence which are important, perhaps even more important, but perhaps they go side by side. And Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, calls these intelligible realities, physical realities on the one side, intelligible realities. And these intelligible realities are these qualities we mentioned earlier, wisdom, love, forgiveness, justice. All these are intelligible realities. And I ask the question really to anybody that's just focused on the physical all the time, would you like to live in the world without any of these intelligible realities? Would you like to be brought up in a family where there's no love and guidance and caring and compassion and mercy and help? Would you like to be brought up in that type of family? Would you like to be brought up in a world where there's hardly any emphasis on these qualities whatsoever? You know, when I was second in secondary education, I taught for many years, uh, 11 to 18 year olds, and there's hardly any time that the word wisdom was mentioned. I don't think I remember one time that it was mentioned by any of the teachers at any particular time. Sometimes there were assemblies where it touched on these things, but there was no emphasis on wisdom. And you think, well, oh my gosh, if there's no emphasis on wisdom, how does that become important in people's lives if there's no emphasis? If there's always emphasis on earning a good living because you can get better money so you can have you can buy a good car, you can buy a house. They might think you're well-to-do, you're successful in life and so on. But in reality, our life is built upon these spiritual qualities. And if we can look at life through that lens, then, as we mentioned earlier, human happiness is founded on spiritual behavior. Then we can see the material aspects of creation of everything in life through a spiritual lens. And that gives us great, great feelings of awe, of wonder, of enchantment, 
because we can see properly through this type of lens that all the messages of God have given us, but it's emphasized more and more and more at this time by Baha'u'llah. Vivian, you said that you had written this book, and I'll repeat the title of the book again. It is Navigating Materialistic Minefields, that you were addressing a different perspective to the issue that your atheistic friend was looking at from a materialistic perspective. Can you give us an example? Yes, he was looking at life that when you die, that's the end of you, which most materialistic people believe. And of course, the teachings of all the great messengers of God, expanded on by Baha'u'llah, absolutely underline the fact that we have a material existence, and when the body dies, our soul goes on to another life, goes on into the next world, of which he didn't believe existed. And I thought, I would write a chapter on the evidence of the human spirit and the spiritual world to enable him to see that possibly there's another way of looking at our reality, not just through our body all the time and our brain. What I brought forward was was some evidences that I regard which enable us to get on that path to think about we have an immortal soul and we will go into the next world, which is a spiritual world, non-physical. And when we're in that world, we will still be ourselves. We will progress through that world, through other invisible worlds of God. So if we can see that we're on an eternal journey back to God, then this can alter the way in which we approach life. So I was bringing some insights into this, which are taken from the Baha'i writings. And what I'd like to do is just, yeah, I'm just thinking that I'd like to read out to you something from this book, which I think, to me, proves that there is another world apart from this world. Of course, it's left to ourselves to go into it, but I bring forward about four or five major arguments for that. And this is what we experience when we go to sleep at night when we dream and we sometimes have a dream of something that's happening in the future. So I'm relating a story about a little girl called Errol Mai Jones and she's a 10 year old girl. She goes to bed one night and she has this dream which I'll go into in a second. But Errol Mai Jones, she's a a Welsh girl and she attended a school not far from where I live called Pant Glass Junior School at Aberfan. Now, many people may not realize the importance of that name, Aberfan. Aberfan was a place where a huge accident occurred in 1966. So this is a story about that accident, which took the lives of many children and adults who were in school in Pant Glass Primary School at that time. And this is the story. On the 21st of October, 1966, a mountain of coal slag and waste towering above the Welsh mining village was destabilized by recent rains, releasing a deadly flow of black coal, sludge and rocks, which engulfed Pant Glass Junior School, obliterating a cottage and 20 houses on its path of destruction. Actually, my father was one of the men at the scene shortly after, as part of the BBC news crew covering the tragedy. He, along with scores of others, tried to rescue the children and adults, but to little avail. Little Errol Mai was one among 116 children and 28 adults who were crushed or suffocated to death that day, in what has been recognised as one of Britain's most horrific peacetime tragedies. Errol and Cannelly had told her mother days before the catastrophe that she was not afraid to die, and added, I shall be with Peter and June. So she told her mother from that dream, I am not afraid to die, and added, I shall be with Peter and June. The day before it happened, Errol said to her mum, let me tell you about my dream last night. This is another one she had. I dreamt I went to school and there was no school there. Something black had come down all over it. 
we all understand, and this is the end of this little story, we all understand that children have great imagination and can sympathize with Errol's mum and feel her soul crushing suffering for not understanding or taking her child's dream premonition seriously. Peter and June were Errol's school friends who also died and were buried side by side in a mass grave as predicted in the dream. So Errol and I had a little glimpse of the future there in the dream and I would be so bold to suggest that many people have had dreams of some event in the future, perhaps not so dramatic and terrible as that, but perhaps on m more mundane events that have occurred. Bahá'u'lláh says that, I'll put it in my own words now, he says that sometimes we have dreams of the future which come true two days later, two years later, ten years later, but we've had an insight into the future in that dream world while the body has been like in the death like condition, like condition, lying on the bed. And we can see that a person wakes up, time goes by, and then they start realizing that dream in the physical world. Now, Baha'u'llah says, if that dream world and this world, this physical world, were the same, then the moment one had that dream of something happening in the future, the moment we had that, if they're both the same world, then we should have had that experience in the physical world the moment that we dreamt it. But because there's a time difference between the two, Baha'u'llah says this is an indication of a non-physical world that we can enter, that we can experience when we go to sleep at night. And then he adds that this has been put into the soul of man, this ability and this experience to the end that materialistic philosophers will not deny the existence of a life beyond the physical world. So it's these type of things I was trying to share with my good friend and I've written about in the book. And you know what comes to mind is the numerous accounts of what they call near-death experiences that also substantiates that viewpoint. In actual fact, Warren, that's another part of that chapter I go into, and they're so exciting. What I was interested in, I recount uh, a number of near-death experiences, but the book is focused on trying to prove that we have an existence past the physical body. What could be validated from there to prove that we'd entered another world during that near-death experience? Because most who have come across reading about that experience or have gone through it themselves, they've had some form of experience of meeting a being of light that's sort of super bright, brighter than a million suns, but the suns don't hurt the person. When I say suns, S-U-N, I mean suns, and engulfed in so much love that they don't want to come back to the body after they've been classed as clinically dead. But that is difficult to prove. But if you can prove that out of the body, when they've been classed as clinically dead through an accident or through an illness or whatever, and they're just tenuously hanging on to life, and they come outside their body, this is what they relate, then they see things happening. So it's those things that are happening outside their body that if that can be validated that they had no way of knowing that when they were on the operating table or in the gutter after being knocked down, then this could go some way to proving that there is a life beyond the physical world as well. Vivian, do you have any new projects that you're working on? <laughs> you know, there's no retiring for Baha'is in the sense of trying to bring our contribution to the betterment of society. You know, we as Baha'is around the world, we're in a time now where we're trying to link in and collaborate with the well-wishes of humanity. You know, it's not a conversion process. It's how can we all work together? How can we all let go of us and them type ways of thinking to believing and working with we, not us and them, but we, the people of this small planet Earth. And if we can see ourselves working together as oneness, we've all been created by God as one human race even though we have all the diverse things that are with us which are wonderful aspects of happiness just like for instance uh, with regards to our different colors which give birth to so much racism 
in the Baha'i writings, it's emphasized time and time again. This is something which is wonderful for us, just like different colored flowers and types in a garden, which is, brings us supreme joy with all this diversity. But so I'm now getting more and more involved in this community building process of trying to bring us all together with a vision of this oneness, with an understanding that mankind is one, with an understanding that religion essentially is one. And I remember a lovely American Baha'i years ago when I was a youngster, he used to say, speaking about all the religions, he said, do you think God is in competition with himself? <laughs> I thought that was absolutely hilarious. So they all come from the same source, our maker, our creator, no matter what name we call our creator. And so to bring people together so that we can work together with our unity in our own neighborhoods and forget about otherness all the time. Let's think about togetherness rather than otherness. And there are a whole array of insights and programs that the Baha'i community has developed over the past several decades for training people to be involved in this understanding of oneness and working together. So I'm heavily involved in that on one side. And I also, if I can, with my age now, if I got my two marbles still working okay <laughs> into the not too distant future, I'm hoping to write another book now focused on spiritual concepts. I want to take 10 of them. Started work on some of them, but two of them are this. The first one is a spiritual concept of infinity. Infinity to me is a wonderful spiritual word because you can't get your head around infinity. All you know is that it could exist and does exist. Baha'u'llah says in the universe, he speaks about the universe didn't have a beginning and it won't have an end and so on. So these are the things that I'm hoping to go into. And when we go through suffering, like my family did, my poor mother and father suffered so much from knowing that the son accidentally electrocuted himself. I didn't want that suffering to be in vain. So when we go through suffering and difficult times, this is an indication, don't let it be in vain. Don't just carry on life as we did before, but it's there to search for something deeper, to prompt us to look for something more. In the words of Baha'u'llah, he says, my calamity is my providence. Outwardly, it's fire and vengeance. Inwardly, it's light and mercy. And if we can see that happening in our own lives, not to be in vain, let's not let all the happenings in our collective living together on this planet through the wars, the famine, the pandemics, all these horrible things that afflict humanity. Let not all this suffering, all this blood that's been spilled, all this tender hearts broken, children just taken into the next world without having an experience of all the wonders of this world. Let's not all that suffering be of no avail. It's happened. We wouldn't wish it on anybody, but let's use it as a purpose for coming together and overcoming, reducing suffering to the lowest possible amount. There's always going to be suffering if we have a physical body and we have a lower nature that we have to deal with because that's where our suffering comes from as well. But let's reduce it to the lowest possible amount so as we can live together in peace and harmony inside ourselves and amongst each other as one noble family coming closer to God. These are the sort of things I want to focus on now if God gives me the time to do it. Vivian, I want to thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Warren, for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Vivian Bartlett, a retired secondary school teacher that wrote about his experience with a transformative youth empowerment program in Swindon, England, titled Nurturing a Healthy Human Spirit in the Young. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website of com, and on the YouTube channel a Baha'i Perspective. You can find the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. For information specifically on the Baha'i Faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you'll join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. Mm -hmm.